Hello, everyone, and welcome to the room, Bugs, Bees, and Bats. My name is Kimi, my pronouns are she, her, and I'll be the host for today's panel. I would like to begin by gratefully acknowledging that Science World is located on the traditional and unceded land of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. We will start today with a quick introduction from our amazing group of mentors, followed by a hosted discussion. If you have any questions for the mentors, please feel free to put them into the chat. Our technician today is Chelsea, who will be monitoring the chat. So if you have any technical issues, they'd be happy to assist. We ask that you keep comments on the chat and question sections respectful and relevant to the topics being discussed. Now it's time to meet our mentors. Let's start by going around and doing a brief introduction before we jump into the questions. So mentors, if you could turn on your cameras, we'll bring you up on screen. Hello, 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 Hi. welcome. Hello. Can we get each of you to let us know your name, your job title, and the thing that you love most about your careers? Who would like to go first? I'll go first. Sure. My name is Teresa. My pronouns are she, her. I am the archivist and operations manager of Merlin Tuttle's Bat Conservation. We're based in Austin, Texas, but we serve worldwide. And I do... Uh, archiving photos, which is like a huge part of my job and managing his National Geographic quality photo collection. I do social media, video production, um, travel planning for our field trips that are around the world, event planning, um, assisting with photography and um, operations, which is uh, a lot of things. So, <laughs> and I get to work with bats. And you get to work with bats. And How I get cool to work with that. bats. <laughs> Claire, what about you? Yeah. Hi, my name is Claire Gooding. Uh, I am a graduate student and researcher at Simon Fraser University, where I'm working on my master's degree. Uh, and I work primarily with Lyme disease ticks, uh, as well as a variety of other creepy crawlies, uh, including wow. flies uh, and ants currently. Wow. And what are you doing with them exactly? Uh, so for the ticks, I'm actually working on developing repellents. Um, so my research is in Good. something known as chemical ecology, uh, um, which is basically a fancy way of saying uh, that I look at how insects and other arthropods smell things. So they, uh, that's basically how they interact okay. largely with the world. Um, okay. So I'm sort of studying how they kind of navigate all of that uh, and how we can potentially use some of those things they find in nature as repellents. Wow. Wow. Okay. Wow. Wow. <laughs> non toxic repellents, essentially. Sorry? Non toxic repellents, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, sort of uh, derived from things that they would uh, naturally want to avoid in their environment. So, uh, things found in nature and then kind of using them uh, sort of against the ticks. <laughs> from the bat person asking the tick person. That's no good question. Good question. <laughs> uh, no, we want, we want the environment to be as, as, you know, untouched as possible. So that's yeah, a good absolutely. question. Um, so how did you both get started in your careers? We've got bats and we've got ants and ticks. So one's in the air, one's in the ground. How <laughs> did you decide which biosphere to go with, I guess? <laughs> I've always been interested in natural sciences. I mean, just, I feel like most people are, you know, when you're a kid and you're like, I like to play outside, you know, that's science. So I have always been interested in it and it, it kind of took me a roundabout way to get here. I didn't really decide to work with bats. I kind of okay. landed here because my I have a background in photography and film and I shoot on film and there was a job posting for archiving Merlin's photo collection, which was all on slide film. Oh, wow. And I was like, wow, that's super cool. I'm so interested in that. And also he's a scientist and National Geographic photographer. And it's always a dream of mine to be a Nat Geo photographer. So I was like, this is so neat. And and then I just met Merlin. We got along and um, I started doing the archive project, the bat scan project, which is still going on today. Um, scanning the photos and archiving them and updating the data. And then within a month, I was doing his social media because I was like, the organization was new and then uh, we became fast friends and I kept doing more and utilizing more and more of my skills because I have a background in communications. That's what my bachelor degree is in. 
So I started doing like operational stuff and assisting on field trips. And um, now I'm a co-founder of the organization and wow. doing all things in between. But everything I know about bats, I learned from this job. Wow. So like I had no idea I was going to work with bats ever. <laughs> wow. Okay. And Claire, That's what so about cool. your journey? <laughs> Yeah, I think mine started sort of similar to Teresa as a okay. kid, just loving playing outside, playing with bugs, uh, <laughs> camping and all those sorts of things. Um, so I guess that kind of uh, sparked my interest in biology in general. Uh, biology classes and school were always my favorite classes. So I went to university to do my bachelor's in biology. Uh, and that's sort of where I decided that I wanted to pursue research specifically uh, and oh, okay. research with insects. So uh, I sort of stumbled upon it a little bit. Uh, I needed an extra class uh, and insect biology was offered that semester. Uh, and it ended up being my favorite class that I ended up taking. Wow. Uh, and from that, that kind of snowballed into a summer job working uh, in an entomology lab with ants. Wow. Uh, and basically from there, I just uh, never wanted to give up insects from there. It just kept, just kept going from there. Uh, and then I eventually decided to uh, do my master's. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Did so you ever have a bug collection when you were little? Yeah. Yeah. That was uh, so a common uh, assignment in entomology classes is they'll have you do uh, an insect collection. So basically they'll give you a, basically an extra fancy butterfly net. Uh, and they'll send you out and have you catch all of these different bugs. Um, and then you'll pin them and preserve them. And then they'll have you identify them all. So that's, I really love that project. It's a very common project if uh, anyone ends up taking a, an entomology class in university. That's really cool. I had one when I was little and a raccoon ate it and I was devastated. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, I, I love, I love that project. Yeah, that's good. Oh, that's awesome. Um, okay. Well, um, you both sort of mentioned it, but you both have university degrees in quite different things, it sounds like. Um, what are some of the skills that helps you get to where you are? And I got to break that down a little bit more. Well, I want to break that into both academic skills. So what do you need academically to get into where you're into your field and into your, your position? And also, what are some of the soft skills? Like what maybe wouldn't you learn in class or from university? What are some other things, other skills? So let's start with the academic side first. So what do you need academically to get to where you are today? One of our um, favorite things that we love to tell people is that anyone can be a scientist. There's no age limit. You're never too young or too old to become a scientist. Mm -hmm. Science is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Everything is connected. You can do science anytime, anywhere. And um, one of the things that we love doing on our field trips is we bring our members and we invite uh, people from the community to join us on field trips and assist Amazing. us with science work. So um, to get into this field, I mean, like my story was just roundabout. I just followed things that I was interested in. And it sounds kind of trite or cliche to be like, just follow your interests. But it really is like, that is how I got here. I was like, oh, this is photography. I like photography. It's, and then it just kept going. So um, I think that's great to know, though, because you don't necessarily yeah. need to go a specific route to end up to where you are. Uh, whereas Claire, it sounds like your journey was a little bit different in yeah. that it was very uh, focused on what you wanted yeah, to do. Yeah, I, I totally agree, though, that uh, sort of your technical credentials are definitely not the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, of course, if you want to do something like a master's degree, of course, you have to tick that box of a bachelor's degree first. Um, but I think overall, sort of uh, the experience you gain, whether that's through a kind of traditional schooling route or through more kind of uh, experience field learning. Um, I think experience in uh, whatever your interest is and whatever kind of field you want to go into is really by far the most important thing. Um, 
And I think that's also sort of where you pick up all of those technical skills that you'll need. Mm -hmm. uh, and you often come across technical skills you never would have considered that you would uh, pick up. I'm sure Teresa can attest to that with all of her work in the field. Like learning along the way. I mean, yeah, you don't absolutely. have to have all the answers. You don't have to understand every bit or direction or even know exactly where you're trying to land. It's just like, taking the next step to follow what you like and what you're interested in. I think especially now, like, you know, when I went to college, the internet was not, you know, it just keeps getting more and more, more, more accessible. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you're seeking opportunities, they're out there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that brings me to sort of the second half of the question is what non-academic skills have done you well to get to where you, you to where you are and I'm thinking more like do you need to be organized do you need to be really detail oriented one common theme I have said before or I've, I've found before is that people always need to have people skills what do you think it's good to be able to communicate with people yeah yeah in this world <laughs> <laughs> for general, sure yeah. but I don't think it's um you know, what does that really mean? Like having people skills. I think there's plenty of scientists that would, from the externally, maybe people would say they do not have people, you know, you don't have to, but sure, it's helpful. I think- What um, about you though? What about in your position? What skills have, have done you well? Yeah, I mean, that does help me. I'm organizing like trips with people. So I do have to like send out a lot of emails and organize information. So I would say organization is huge. Um, also like managing my time and my energy and being mm. able to understand myself to where I'm like, where are my limits of mm -hmm. you know, setting I'm boundaries, like, setting mm -hmm. healthy boundaries. Yes. <laughs> and I'm still working on that. I mean, yep. that's still something that I'm learning, but um again, learning out on the way. Absolutely. As yeah. are we all, we are all on the journey with you. <laughs> uh, Claire, what do you think? Yeah, Skills absolutely. That, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Absolutely. Organization. That's definitely not a skill that I've always had, <laughs> um, but has been one I've definitely had to learn and definitely uh, will streamline anything that you're, any goals you're aiming to achieve. Organization's a big thing. Um, I think as well, it's not the most exciting answer, but patience, um, that's, that's unfortunately, good. or I guess fortunately, a good skill um, that you will definitely gain if you pursue a career in science. Uh, there are days that are super exciting and it's all go, go, go. Uh, but then there are other days where it's uh, doing the same thing all day just so you can get to uh, kind of where you need to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I echo that for sure. And I'm, I imagine in your field, like doing research, especially like stuff gets really repetitive. It can, it can. Yeah, yeah it's not, a, sometimes uh, you have setbacks as well. So kind of persevering through those setbacks. Mm. Um, but in my experience, when you're doing something that you really care about, like if you really care about your research or whatever kind of project you're doing, uh, of course, it can be frustrating sometimes. But you sort of, I think you kind of naturally gain that kind of patience more than we might for other things. I feel like that's a really good point to make. And it's a very undervalued trait. I think patience, um, definitely in science, you need it. I know that too. Um, in science and, and, and working with animals, you need patience. So definitely a good one to keep in mind. Um, so we talked about the skills that you've utilized to get to where you are. What if I was a 14 year old who was who saw this video and went, oh, my God, I really need to learn more about these two wonderful women. Are there resources out there for me as a 14 year old um, that I can access? Should I be volunteering somewhere? Should I be finding mentors? Um, what do you think? Teresa? Yeah, definitely. I mean, a resource for bat work, I would say right. our website, MerlinTuttle.org. And right. there's even a page where Merlin shares his advice for young people interested in conservation and science. And um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what he said. I mean, fortunately, he was like me, where he had parents that fostered a curiosity of nature mm -hmm. and an interest in nature and um, having mentors and people in your life that do support Support those interests makes a really big difference. Absolutely. Um, and so if you don't have anyone like that in your life, you can 
find them, you know, volunteer with any nature organization. Maybe yeah. there's not a bat rehabber in your area or, you know, a bat scientist that you can talk to. Just volunteer with someone that can support your curiosity in nature, I think can go a really long way and um, lead to different things. I think knowing that each decision or each like turn is not the last turn, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you're like, oh, I just started volunteering with the forestry department or something like that, but I really want to do bats. It's like, well, it doesn't mean you're stuck in the forestry department. It's just like one turn and you can keep asking like, where's the bats at? Where are the bats? And, like, <laughs> and you'll get there. Yeah, That's absolutely. Really I'm a big yeah. proponent of volunteer work. I think it's a great way, uh, especially early in your career, um, that you can uh, kind of experiment with things you'd like to try out. It's a great way to sort of sample all of what's out there with often relatively small time commitments, a few hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great way to learn and you're also helping out quite a bit. Um, if you're in the lower mainland, I believe like the aquarium, Vancouver Aquarium takes volunteers, uh, animal shelters take volunteers. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in that kind of animal care side, um, wildlife rehabilitations. There's even uh, scientific volunteer year work you can do virtually now. Um, there's a few sites uh, that will uh, basically recruit the general public to do things like analyze photos to help out research projects. So if you want a kind of a taste of that sort of research side of things, uh, that's a great way to kind of get your feet wet and kind of see what you like. What if I really liked bugs, Claire? I don't mean to put you on the spot. Is there <laughs> somewhere I could go to find out more about? Um, well, there's the good news is that there's bugs everywhere. True. <laughs> anyone can That's start true. with, yeah. <laughs> anyone yeah. can start with an insect collection. Uh, you can catch insects with a net from the dollar store. Okay, don't uh, do that with them in yeah, your freezer. Do <laughs> yeah, don't catch bats. Sorry, Definitely I'm don't do this with bats. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can do a lot of the things that real entomologists do um, kind of on your own. You can go out into parks and whatnot and you can catch bugs with little uh, pitfall traps and you can kind of look at them and see if you can start identifying kind of what kind of insects you're looking at. And believe it or not, that's a lot of what real entomologists do on a day to day basis. Um, if you'd like to, there's also some sort of citizen science initiatives. Oh, cool. um, you can, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of the iNaturalist app. Um, Maybe, yeah. Basically, it allows anyone to download this app and take photos of uh, plants or animals or insects, anything really, uh, and kind of attempt to identify them and then upload that for everyone else to see. Oh, cool. And that kind of sort of builds kind of a, a citizen science database of kind of what kind of biodiversity is around you. Oh, cool. So you're crowd, they're crowdsourcing data and you can also be a part of like a really large experiment sort of. Yeah, exactly. Very cool. Um, Claire, I'm going to put this question to you first and then we'll okay. go to Teresa because I think Teresa, you're going to have quite a bit to say on it. But <laughs> Claire, um, so obviously we're in 2022 right now. Yes. Global pandemic. And everything has changed, you know, fields, careers, they've all changed. How has the pandemic changed your field? And how do you see your field moving forward post pandemic? You know, obviously things aren't the same from pre pandemic to post. So how has it changed your field? Mm -hmm. And yeah, how, what, what's the future of your, yeah. of your field? So fortunately, uh, COVID does not infect insects. <laughs> um, so that part at least stays the same. Um, but in terms of sort of the kind of academia research landscape, mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely changed things quite a bit. In some ways, it's been more difficult, of course, but there's also been uh, advancements that I think are quite good. For example, oh. um, there are conferences where people share their research and they have become a lot more accessible oh. uh, as sort of a byproduct of COVID, yes. um, because now most conferences offer a virtual option, um, and I believe many are choosing to continue that going forward, um, which is great in my opinion. Uh, I think great. it makes it a lot more accessible. You don't need as much money or as much time to be able to kind of meet all sorts of other scientists. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the silver lining from my perspective. Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. But, 
Yeah, I've definitely been fortunate to not have been as affected as I know many people were uh, as a lab-based scientist. Yeah, yeah, wow. That's, yeah, that's really cool. But I guess it doesn't really change your hands-on with bugs. Because like yeah. you said, bugs are here and they're not really going anywhere. <laughs> they're nice and reliable. <laughs> they're very reliable that way. That's true. So, Teresa, same question to you with bats and the pandemic. Um, yes. How has um, your field changed? It's changed quite a bit, especially for us at our organization. A large part of what we do is travel to different places and uh, support bat conservation in local communities. Um, for example, like we would go to Panama where they have a large reserve um, and or Ecuador where they have a reserve and we do a bat survey there so that they can understand what bats they have available like in their area and then thereby learn what do these bats need and how can we support mm. their needs, support their habitat so that they can remain populous and healthy and mm. have food and keep everything good for them. Mm. Um, a lot of people just don't know. There's a lot that left to be discovered about bats. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't travel as freely as um, I, we haven't traveled much in the past two years. We're starting again to travel this year, uh, which is exciting. <clears throat> but another thing is that bats have been wrongly speculated to be connected with the COVID-19 mm -hmm. virus. Um, there is actually no documentation to support that COVID-19 has ever been transmitted from a bat to a human. Okay. Um, even though they're often presented as a possible source. So it's a lot of, if you pay attention to the language, you'll see that this is all speculation. It's like, it may be, it possibly, be, blah, blah, blah. but it's being presented as fact. So it's, wow. it's really like a slippery slope, but rest assured, I can confirm that there is no connection <laughs> yet. You know, nothing has ever been documented that connects bats to COVID-19. So there's nothing to fear on that front. Um, in fact, there's no documentation for COVID-19, for Ebola, SARS, MERS, or Hendra, which are all often speculated to be coming from bats. Wow, um, okay. Yeah, bats have uh, kind of a rough reputation. Yes, they do. And um, that's a lot of what we do is we show Merlin's photos, which are representing bats as they truly, naturally are as gentle, non-aggressive, just sweet little fluffy creatures. They're so cute. They really are. But um, we often liken, you know, sometimes you'll see pictures of bats that are snarling in self-defense. And that's because whoever took the picture picked them up and squeezed them and was like, take a picture. And they were like, ah. <laughs> and I so you never do that too. Yeah, that's fair. We would do that too. <laughs> and like, you don't say, look how cute my dog is when he's like hungry and like, ah, get, you know, like you don't show that picture to mm -hmm. illustrate what your dog is like, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's the power of having like natural photos like we have on our website. Um, but yeah, so since COVID uh, a lot of our work is correcting misinformation, um, providing interviews and resources for folks who are writing about bats or COVID and just helping them get the facts straight. Um, mm -hmm. We have a website, a uh, site that a link that I shared with you about that, that mm -hmm. has like not only about COVID, but also about rabies and okay. MIPA and fear of bats and everything on this subject uh, with citations. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the basic gist of it is that it's speculation. And um, the sad thing is that fear of bats leads to intolerance and killing. Mm -hmm. And so we have seen like an uptick in that worldwide. And that's we know that that's just what's being reported. And so yeah. it's happening a lot more than we know. Um, and that's really dangerous because bats are keystone species all over the world, meaning they are crucial for the ecosystems and the um, economy of where they live because of their services of like pollination and seed dispersal mm -hmm. and consuming pests that that mm -hmm. would otherwise kill crops or mm -hmm. like mosquitoes that are super annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it does, it is really important for humans to take care of bats because it affects us, you know, yeah. a lot of times we say like the work that we do is 
through bats, but it's like for humans. Mm -hmm. It's you know, bats are like the vehicle for just living more harmoniously with nature and absolutely. living together. Yeah, absolutely. So it's they're sort of like bees, like the way that we look at bees. Mm -hmm. Like they're so important to crops, and we're I feel like we're just sort of now realizing how important they are in the past several hundred years that we've you know had honeybees, yes. but bats are sound like they're just as important for yeah. our livelihood, much less theirs. So definitely. And bees are pollinating, which is absolutely crucial. But bats are pollinating, dispersing seeds, um, and eating pests. Triple. They're they do triple the amount of work. They have multi-purpose. <laughs> mm -hmm. All over the place. All right, and they well, live on every continent except Antarctica. There's over wow. 1,400 species wow. of bats in the world that we know of. Wow. Um, yeah, they're amazing. You should look at our look at our photography page. You'll see them. I guarantee you'll see some things that you were like, I did not know a bat could look like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Claire, do you have any you know quick facts, cool facts about ticks and ants that you want to drop Ooh. in here right now? Ah, uh, good question. Um, Sorry, I totally put you on the spot. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> I definitely have some cool facts about yeah. ants. Um, so ants. They're super interesting, as I'm sure many people know. They live in these uh, complex colonies. Uh, they're social insects. Uh, and actually, a lot of the things that people often think of as, well, only people have done that ants have done as well. Ooh. So ants will engage in agriculture. Uh, they will leaf cutter ants. Uh, they actually don't eat leaves. They will chew them up and they'll use them to grow a fungus, which they then harvest. Um, there are also ants which will uh, basically farm aphids. So they'll take care of a little colony of aphids so that they can eat this um, this sweet substance called honeydew that the aphids produce. It's actually really cool. You can see it uh, in many places around BC. If you see um, those bigger black ants, um, if you watch them closely, you might see them climbing up a tree and they'll basically defend a little colony of aphids. Uh, I think of the aphids as like little cows and then the, the ants are like the little farmers, the little farmers protecting them from everything. Oh. Uh, basically to milk them for the that. honeydew. I've also heard that analogy and it is, yeah, spot on. I yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, thank you both. I mean, I've, I've learned so much already about bats and ants. This is, this is great. Um, so I think we've talked about, you know, the skills that you need and the resources and how much the pandemic has changed. Uh, your field. And now, before we started, I did ask you to think about some advice that you would either give to yourself uh, when you were 14 or to a 14-year-old watching us right now. What advice would you give them if they wanted to, you know, be sitting in your seat in a few years or at some point in the future? What advice would you give them or yourself when you were 14? I would say follow your interests, like truly. And um, I think it's harder to do than, than it is to say, obviously, sure, but, yep. but like, it, it's pretty simple. Like if you're interested in something, someone's doing that. And even today I hear people doing things. I'm like, that's your job. Oh my gosh. That is so cool. And I feel like, especially in science, because there's people doing like sloths, bats, ants, also like dirt, <laughs> canopy, treetops, you know, like deepest darks of the ocean, like every little plankton, like every single thing in science is something that you can study and learn about and discover things. And so it might not seem straightforward, but like really following what you're interested in will like eventually get you there, I believe. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And sort of building off of that, yeah. I think um, a lot of people would be surprised just how many people there are out there who are so willing to sort of take you under their wing and kind of show you what they do. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of a lot of it is about just kind of getting yourself, getting your foot in the door and kind of getting yourself out there. Um, and then once you kind of start meeting all these people who have similar interests to you, uh, opportunities for jobs or for uh, different studies often just sort of present themselves and it kind of all 
flows together. Um, but definitely kind of just pursuing things you're interested in and not being afraid to change what those interests are. Uh, almost everyone I know uh, that I went to university with uh, changed what they wanted to do at some yeah. point. They they went in thinking they were going to do one thing and they ended oh, yeah. up doing another. Um, and it's not as hard as you think to sort of change the path you're on. It's never too late to kind of turn around and go back and try something else or totally. transition from one thing to another. Oh. It's There's a lot more switching around than people might think. Oh, totally. I completely agree. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a, like what I was saying before, just like, it's not the last thing you're going to do. Yeah, like, absolutely. Like, I want to study deer. And then you're like, no, I want to study ticks. Like, oh, through <laughs> deer, I learned about ticks and now I like ticks. Yeah. So go do ticks. That's, you found yeah, it. I, you know? I would not have, ex at 14, I would not have thought I'd be studying ticks. <laughs> I didn't think I'd be studying bats either. Like, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I think yeah. what you said is really important too. Like people are so willing, you know, if a 14 year old, 15, if any, anybody came up to me and was excited and curious, like I would be happy to talk to them. Like there's so, every, I feel like so many people are like that where they're willing to yeah. take you under their wing, like you said, Claire. And just to share like a really quick, inspiring story. That's like what Marilyn did. Merlin's story is exactly like that. Like he was in the fifth grade and he was like, a mammologist heard a mammologist talk and he was like cool that is what i want to do god wow. and then in high school he was just out in nature observing these bats in a cave looking at the books and he said oh i'm observing these bats doing something different than what the book says that they do and so he convinced his mom to take him to smithsonian museum and just showed up and was like i noticed something and i have something to say about that like just showed up and was like i'm curious i'm interested this is what i figured out and it turns out yeah he discovered that these bats go somewhere else and they don't hibernate there and they and so they smithsonian gave him some bat bands and he banded bats and he that was like that was it he started going so like you can seek and find people that will support you very awesome we've actually had a question from the comments do you need to be very good at calculus? Ooh, <laughs> infamous calculus. No. Uh, well, I, I definitely have an answer for that. I had to take two calculus courses oh, there you go. Uh, for my undergraduate degree. Whoa. And calculus two, which is uh, uh, integral calculus, I failed that on my first attempt. Um, but I went back and took it again. So definitely you can... Uh, it's, it's, of course, great if you are good at calculus, um, but and you do not have to be uh, a math wizard. Um, and if you have weak points that are needed for a degree, there's always ways to work around that. Um, I find often uh, if people don't perform well in a class, it's often not a reflection on that person. It's often just a matter of you haven't found kind of the study method that works for you yet. Absolutely. Um, and it's kind of just about kind of coming back to it. Uh, and eventually you'll get through calculus um, and you'll be you'll be free. <laughs> <laughs> but I can say I definitely uh, don't use a lot of calculus in my day to day life. If that's a if that's a comfort to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so you might have had it to get to where you are now. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely not in the day to day. That's good to know. Um, I had a question um because we're talking about bats we're talking about ticks what are some misconceptions about ticks and ants and bats that you want to clear up right now and let's talk pre-pandemic because we already talked about you know how bats are you know not uh, guilty of anything for the pandemic so pre-pandemic for bats what are some misconceptions and same for that for for ticks and ants what are some misconceptions that you can clear up some common ones that you know the you know the public have talked about i think some of the favorite ones are like bats get caught in your hair they don't mm. they can detect <laughs> with echolocation or with their eyes bats are not blind that's another one mm -hmm. no bat is blind uh but bats can detect like a human hair on like a glass table like they are very sharp 
with their senses. So they do not get caught in your hair. They are not blind. Um, vampire bats is something that people are often really curious about. There's, mm -hmm. like I said, over 1,400 species of bats. Wow. Three of them are vampire, and they only live in Latin America. That is it. <laughs> um, okay. One of them drinks bird blood only and, wow. or, oh, is it the other way? They drink bird and mammal. One of them is only bird, but um, they're not as much of a problem as uh, media might make you think. Um, as long as you don't sleep outside without a mosquito net, they're not after you. They're not going to get you. Okay, <laughs> and they don't know seek out humans. Bats in general do not attack unprovoked, much like a lot of dogs, although dogs, some dogs might. <laughs> but just to like put in perspective, I mean, bats will only attack if they're sick or being provoked. So just simply leave bats alone and you have nothing to fear. Just don't touch them, especially if you find one on the ground or like, um, you can, on our website, we have a page about bats in buildings. If there's one in your house, like what to do. It's really simply just keep eyes on it, open a window. Don't take your eyes off it, kind of like a spider where you'd be like, if I take my eyes off it, it will move and I do not know where it went. <laughs> so just keep your eyes on it and kind of shoot out with like a towel or like gently with a broom or something. You know, the bats do not want you. They want to get away <laughs> from you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um and like outside, if you find one, um, don't touch it. You can, again, like scoop it up with a broom and let it crawl onto a tree. That's like a really easy, safe way to deal with it. Um, or call a local animal rehabber or something. But yeah, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about bats just in general being um, maybe aggressive or scary, but they're not. They're incredibly sweet and gentle and... They have personalities. They're very social. Um, nothing to be afraid of. Claire, misconceptions yeah, um, about ticks and ants that you want to clear up right here, right now? Well, ticks, of course, are not quite as uh, friendly as bats. <laughs> they unfortunately do want to get at you. Um, but um, there are a lot. Uh, they're definitely very preventable for being bitten by ticks. Um, I know a lot of people are very worried about Lyme disease. It is a very mm. scary disease that can have lifelong consequences, um, but it is very much preventable. Um, ticks actually can't transmit Lyme disease unless they've been attached for at least 24 hours. Oh, wow. um, so okay. if you are bitten by a tick, if you remove it soon after, wow. um, you very, very, very little risk of contracting Lyme disease. I have a question about that. Yes. But I don't want to interrupt you. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, well, I saw a thing where, like, you can remove it with, like, peppermint oil and, like, tweezers, I guess. But, like, I saw something, maybe it was tea tree oil, or they, like, put it on and the tick was, like, uh, like grossed there out. There is some like, evidence that out. ticks don't like some essential oils, um, but the sort of official recommendation of if you are bitten by a tick is to basically get a very fine pointed pair of tweezers um, and basically uh, attach to the point of their mouth parts that is closest to your skin. So basically get as close to your skin as possible mm, uh, and pull them out that way uh, because okay. Uh, their mouth parts can break off if you pull them the wrong way. So basically by pulling onto those mouth parts, uh, that is the safest way to remove a tick. Uh, I've seen all sorts of little devices and things that are so all these fancy ways that are supposed to remove ticks. Um, but sort of the tried and true method is to just carry a, a pair of tweezers with you if you're going out hiking. <laughs> oh, that's a good skill. Like, yeah, prepared. <laughs> Yes. For going out in the field. Like Absolutely. if you are going to go in the woods and be like, I'm going to find five different bugs or whatever, like being prepared <laughs> and planning and having lists, like checklists yes. for when you're like packing to go either on a trip or even just out for a hike or whatever, I think is super, super important skill. Would and unexpected too. Yeah. Um, I am going to have to wrap it up here though. Oh, one. Oh, I don't know if we can answer that. Most use software you use to analyze data. Three words. Oh, we are. 
uh, R, the coding language R is definitely the biggest one for uh, biology. And there's lots of resources online if anyone wants to kind of get a head start on learning to use that. Okay. And Teresa? I said Adobe Lightroom for photo organizing. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so we are done now. Thank you so much, both um, both of you, for joining us and for sharing all of your information and knowledge. So if you have joined us today on video, we will have more sessions happening on Saturday. So be sure to plan what sessions you want to attend. And we'll see you there and next time. And we hope we do see you there. So thank, thank you, you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciated it.